Welcome to Conversations with the Planets with Lori Kaufman and Alicia Sealheiser, a podcast that roots the wisdom of the stars into our lived experiences here on Earth and weaves the power of diverse healing modalities together with astrology. And today we're continuing our discussion of essential dignity by talking about having planets in their own bounds or their own terms, which is the same thing, just different words. And this is a way of assessing the strength or weakness of a planet in your birth chart. It's a continuation of our series on essential dignity. We've linked all the other episodes that we've done down below of discussing other forms of dignity that a planet might experience. But essentially the bounds, the way um, like Demetra George, the sunrise queen herself, the Leo sunrise <laughs> queen, no less, such a beautiful birth chart. But the way she describes it in her book, Ancient Astrology, um, this is volume one, Assessing Planetary Condition, she really likens bounds, if a planet's in its own bounds, to it being like a teacher in a classroom. And so whatever planet is the domicile ruler of that sign. And if you don't know what that means, there's a link down below of what does it mean when a planet's in its own sign. Um, And that's what we're talking about with domicile rulership. That planet functions kind of like the principal who sets the overall rules for the school and the overall context of how the school is operated. But then within each sign, there's five unequal, unequal sections of the zodiac signs where the um, five visible planets, not the sun and moon, have bound rulership. So that means that Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn are all bound lords in different sections of each of those zodiac signs. And the bound lord of each section is like the teacher of that school. And so, you know, teachers are able to really set a lot of their own rules and their own context for how the whole like situation plays out while the principal still has authority. But um, Demetra also m- mentions that Firmicus Maternus said that having a planet in its own bounds was equal to the strength that a planet in domicile has. And so there is yeah. evidence that at least one, if not many, ancient Hellenistic astrologers viewed ba- viewed bound rulership as a really significant powerful thing for a planet to have if they're in their own bounds um and so you know this can be useful in general for assessing the condition of a planet in your chart if you have a planet who might be in detriment or fall or might be struggling for other reasons if they're in their own bounds they're going to have more strength to bring about their significations in a positive way for your life An example that Kelly Surtees uses a lot in her teaching, because Kelly uses bounds a lot, and this is where Mm -hmm. I learned it because um, I'm a student of Kelly Surtees, but Kelly loves to use Brene Brown's chart as an example of this because Brene Brown is a Sagittarius rising with Jupiter in detriment in Gemini and Mercury in detriment in Sagittarius, but then Mercury is in its own bounds. And so obviously Brene Brown has been incredibly successful. She's been very successful in very mercurial things. She has an incredibly popular TED talk. She's a professor and a researcher. And she also is studying the nature of disordered thinking, like Mercury and Sag, but that Mercury in Sag in its own bounds has extra dignity because it's its own bound ruler. So this can be a remediating factor for a planet that's difficultly placed. And also if you have a planet who's really strongly placed, if you have Jupiter and Sag in its own bounds, that's just an extra boost of autonomy and power that that planet is then given to really be positive in your life. Um, Also just generally looking at who the bound rulers of your planets are can be helpful. Like I have multiple planets that are in the bounds of Jupiter and Venus. And that's really nice. Like Demetra talks about how those like, if you have a planet in the bound of a benefic, it would be the nice teacher who maybe throws pizza parties and doesn't give too much homework and is helping you and encouraging you. Whereas I also have like my ascendant and my ascendant ruler in the bounds of Mars and Saturn. And those are the teachers who, you know, like hit you with a ruler and take off points for minor like mistakes you make and like not allow you to be late. And they're going to be a lot stricter in how they treat your planets. 
So just this is a way to assess the dignity of any of your planets, like my Venus and Scorpio, when I'm looking for help for her <laughs> and I learned about bounds and I'm like, oh, yay. And then I look at my chart and she's in Saturn's bounds and I'm like, oh, that makes it even harder for Venus. So it can help you more understand <laughs> the nature of the like what your planet's dealing with and what their potential is um, and how to work with it. You know, if I know that my Venus mm -hmm. has to play by Saturn's rules, like that's useful, then I can just play by Saturn's rules, I say, as I have like a torn knee. Um, <laughs> and also another way that this is really useful is with progressions. And we did a whole mm -hmm. episode talking about secondary progressions um, that's also linked below. But because progressed planets move so slowly, they'll move through the bounds of a planet for several years. And so really understanding is like, is your progressed moon, like who's the bound lord of your progressed moon and what sort of flavor is coming through your life with that planet can be another like, shout out to Kelly Sertiz again for teaching that theory. That's like another way to work with bounds and progressions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, very well said. I definitely think that like bounds are, it's cool to understand when your planet isn't working at its fullest capacity, like who is kind of in charge of it, right? Like, because mm -hmm. it, it is going to have its domicile lord um, first, first things first, but like the secondary, like understanding its bound lord can give a little bit more insight on like how that planet can start to kind of work a little harder or understand the game that it has to play or you might see some secret support like oh wow my right. moon's in the bounds of jupiter that's great that's helpful yeah <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah um and with that getting like and this is you know we're starting to get really technical with talking about astrology and so like from this whole right. essential dignity series like if you're more beginning with astrology like just sticking with domicile and fall and exaltation yeah. and detriment and like that is plenty like you don't need to get into the minutia of bounds but if you're like a huge astrology nerd like we are it can be <laughs> really fun to play around with but yeah assessing the condition of your bound lord can also help like sticking with my totally. venus in saturn's bounds i also have a night chart so my saturn is my out of sect malefic my saturn is really hard on me my saturn's in the sixth house maltreating my moon you know so there's like all of those things whereas if lori had a planet in saturn's bounds in her chart where she has saturn and aquarius in a day chart with triplicity like a lot more support for her saturn mm -hmm. like that saturn might like still be a strict teacher but maybe it's one of the strict teachers that you actually really love who like really is like the one who pushes you to do what you need to do. Whereas my Saturn is, yeah. I'm still learning. I'm in my <laughs> Saturn return. I'm still learning what she's doing. But in general, just to say like assessing the condition of the bound Lord is like an even deeper level of that. Or also like my son in Scorpio is in Venus's bounds and Venus's bounds in Scorpio are going to feel very different in a place of her detriment than Venus's bounds and Pisces would feel in a place of her exaltation. So understanding, or like my ascendant in Libra is in Mars's bounds and Mars also has detriment in Libra. And so that Mars and Libra bound is going to be a lot more difficult than if my ascendant were in Mars's bounds in Scorpio where Mars has rulership. So there's a lot of nuance that you can bring in if you really want to nerd out when you're working with bounds. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I have a lot of um, several of my planets and angles are in Jupiter's bounds. And I have a day chart. Um, and Jupiter is in its own bounds. Um, so that and it has triplicity. And there's a couple other things that make my Jupiter um, better. Otherwise, it would be kind of just neutral. Um, so this can definitely be one of those things that can help a planet and give it a little bit more validity to kind of do whatever it is that it is wanting to do um in a stronger way that Absolutely. it wouldn't necessarily otherwise have yeah like sticking with the teacher example Demetra likens yeah. a planet in its own bounds to being like doing an independent study and you're kind of just setting the terms of yeah, how you she go kind about of is it just doing what she wants to mm -hmm. um I'm going to share a chart from the astrology podcast which is also linked down below if you want to go explore 
it, but it's a really helpful essential dignity chart. And so what we're talking about in this episode is the bounds, which are here. So you can see like Aries, Jupiter rules the first six degrees of Aries. Um, But one very nuanced thing that's very important to bring up here is the difference between zero and one, which could be its own yeah. episode. Mm-hmm. I'm sure we'll never actually record an episode on it, but there's like so much fascinating, like the ancients didn't think of zero. Like, I don't even know the history of zero, but zero is a more modern concept. And so when you're counting yeah. and you're working with ancient astrology, like this is a technique from, you know, that most or like many of the Hellenistic authors have cited and worked with. Um, then you have to understand like, how are they counting? How are we counting? And so I'm actually just going to read an excerpt from Demetra's book so that I don't butcher this. But she says, to determine the bound lord of a planet in a particular birth chart, locate its sign and degree on the table. So if we're saying like Lori has her moon in early Aries, so we're like, okay, there's Mm -hmm. early Aries. See which planet rules the sector in which the degree is located. That planet is the bound lord of the planet under inquiry. When checking each planet, this is the important part. Be sure to round up to the next degree for any position that is greater than the whole integer. A planet at six degrees, zero, zero minutes is read as six degrees Aries. And so then it would be in Jupiter's bounds. But if that planet were at six degrees Aries, one minute, zero, one minute, it would be read as seven Aries. And so this, like for me, that changed who was the bound lord of my ascendant from uh, Venus to Mars in Libra. That's a big difference. If Venus is your bound lord in Libra, that's beautiful. If Mars is your bound lord in Libra, that's a little more difficult um, because my ascendant is actually 28 degrees and some minutes of Libra. So this is very important to actually understand that if you have a planet or an angle at the number that's listed here like the way chris brennan lists this is like through x degree number of degrees so if you have it at that number if it's any more than zero zero minutes it's actually in the bound of the next planet so that nuance is really important there is a setting in astro.com and i'm sure most other astrology Mm -hmm. softwares where you can put the Egyptian bounds on your charts and then just make that a permanent setting. And I have that turned on. So then when I'm looking at a chart, Mm -hmm. I can just see like, oh, wow, this person has three planets in their own bounds and it shows the little line and then you don't have to do the math. So there's other ways to work with it. But like, this is, it's a very precise thing. And I'll also say that there's multiple different, like, you'll see that it's just random. Like it's like, or it seems random and we don't have any surviving texts that explain the rationale of like how they split up because it's unevenly split like the decans are like each 10 degrees but these are just uneven like Aries yeah. like the first six degrees are Jupiter but when you get to Taurus it's the first eight degrees are Venus you know so it's yeah they're very uneven looking they're very uneven and there's different forms of terms or bounds and so these are from the Egyptian bounds. You can see Chris Brennan yeah. put that here. That's how I've been taught by both Demetri George and Kelly Surtees. There are other forms of bounds. There's like and- two or three others. I was just going to say. Um, so if you go turn that setting on, make sure that it says Egyptian next to it because mm-hmm. there's there's options. <laughs> And yeah, it would be interesting to do research into like where those come what from the other and ones are. why the Egyptian ones are so prioritized by um, like a lot of everybody. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and I was in a class with Judith Hill where someone asked if she works with bounds or terms and she said no, because there are multiple versions and it's confusing to figure out like, and it's so precise with like the minutes, you know, like what's the minute yeah. of it. And she's like, she just, it's not resonant for her. Whereas like Kelly Surtees teaches it and teaches that she works with it a lot and finds it really potent. Um, So yeah, I mean, all of these are, they're techniques that are being made available to us now. And um, we're just kind of like playing around with them and seeing if they work, how they show up, if they don't like, this is the theory. And now the time, like we're in a place with the transmission of all of these ancient texts that now we can actually apply the theory and see if 
we actually feel like the theory is correct and if we see it play out in our life. And I personally have found bounds to be pretty resonant as I've been working with them, but Mm -hmm you know, just that disclaimer that there's always a nuance and kind of discussion between different astrologers of whether to work with the bounds or not. And if this isn't resonant for you, find a technique that is and stick with that. Yeah, yeah. And I, I've i found bounds to be fairly resonant as well. Um, I kind of mentioned in the triplicity one that it that's not something that's super on my radar. I don't use triplicity it's not that I don't use it. I just don't think about it much, but every single one of my planets are in triplicity. So <laughs> after the episode, we were talking about that. And um, I think that's maybe why I, I don't use them. Yeah, it's like but, you don't realize the gifts you have sometimes. Right. <laughs> like they just, they but Lori has so much community support in her life and she has so much yeah. triplicity. So it's like, oh yeah, no, maybe that is like a gift from your birth chart. Yeah, yeah, and that definitely makes sense, but I do notice it with the bounds. I do notice them come through a lot, particularly my um Pisces Venus, um because it is in the bounds of Mars. Um yeah, it's at 24. And that is something that I see. Wait, wouldn't that put it in Mercury's bounds? If it's at 24? No. It's in Mars. It's from 19 to 28 on that. Like 28 is when it ends. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. right. Sorry. Yeah. Mercury is so <laughs> retrograde. I will it's say very that. Retrograde. And I feel like this moment was good to be like, okay, wait, how are we actually reading this chart? Yeah, actually, um, that's a good good point. <laughs> so that is a good disclaimer, right? So it's like if you're yeah. looking at Pisces, if it's through 12, Venus yes. rules it. If it's through, if it's from 12 to 16, Jupiter rules it. If it's from 16 to 19, Mercury rules it. And then 19 to 28. Mars rules it, so then 24 would be ruled by Mars. Yes, I feel like that is good. To you like confused clarify. me for a second. I was like, I'm 100% sure, and now I'm questioning. I know. I'm like, I feel like you should know that, but okay, cool. Oh, yes, well, and I also have a mutual reception, if you will, of the, the bounds between my um, Pisces Venus and my Cancer Mars. Mm. Um, they are in each other's bounds. Um, but yeah, this um, I've always joked that Saturn is actually my benefic and Venus is actually my malefic, even though it is in mm-hmm. Pisces, it is exalted. Um, but I do think that Mars is kind of where that comes through and makes Venus like things a little bit more difficult, like the things that Venus would rule. I definitely think Mars comes through a lot in Mm. that because mars um or sorry venus and my mcic are the only things i have in malefic bounds Mm. lucky you except for that poor venus yeah and then i mean it just makes me think of how you say that you feel like saturn and mars bully your venus and then like literally they are in charge of venus and then you know we can get back to the nuance (laughs) i was mentioning earlier of Lori has mars and cancer in fall in a day chart so it might be a little easier if any mars is easy Mm -hmm. if like mars were in scorpio in a night chart like maybe mars wouldn't be so hard on your venus although mars would always be mars is pretty yeah (laughs) um but like your saturn right like your saturn's gonna like i already said would be a better teacher than my saturn because of the condition but your mars would absolutely not be a teacher that i would sign up for a class with in college if i could avoid Oh, yeah. Well, and my MC and IC are both in um, Saturn's bounds. So they, not great, but like fine. (laughs) Whereas, yeah, Venus is the only one. It's the only thing I have in Mars's bounds. And I feel that. So there, that's definitely something to point out too. If you have that like one planet that feels difficult for no reason and we talked about that in the exaltation episode a little bit too um because my pisces venus is always the first thing people see and notice in my chart um and i'm always like no (laughs) and then it makes you angry you have like a mars reaction to it (laughs) it it gives me such a mars reaction and yeah i mean like understanding that my venus is in mars is bounds like made so much sense to me like that was the thing that finally made me be like okay there it is like that's Mm -hmm. why 
this planet like feels it feels so difficult even though it like on paper like is doing well (laughs) yeah which is why you have to assess like the entire I mean you don't have to like go as deep as you want but especially when you're dealing with your own birth chart like it like the more you can understand of exactly how your specific planet is functioning it just gives so much nuance which can really like it makes me feel really seen and gives me more language for understanding how my life is playing out you know that's what I was just gonna say because it like it's not necessarily that you're looking for conflict or like looking for something to be good or bad, right? Like, because what even is good and bad? But there's this idea that like everyone looks at my chart and says, wow, look at that Pisces Venus. Like that's always what people see. And I always feel like that's what people see when they meet me too, because it's on my MC. Like it makes sense. But it's that Mars energy that really comes through. And so sometimes like just feeling seen, feeling understood by those difficult things that do kind of add that nuance to it. Like it can still be an exalted planet in its triplicity lord, right? Like it can still, yeah, it can still be like a really strong placement but it's in a cadent house in Mars's bounds. <laughs> mm-hmm. So like there are things and in a day chart as well. So then in a, a day little chart. less ju- juice if it's a night planet like Venus is. Yes, exactly. So there can be things that like almost like even a planet out or like neutralize it, I guess is kind of what I'm trying to say. Well, I don't even know if it's necessarily I feel like these are like layers like they're all yeah. things that then True. Venus like Venus gets to be in her exalted place and like Pisces is just a very helpful habitat for Venus things and sure. there's absolutely ways that shows up in your life but then Venus has to deal with Mars so yeah. it's a little spicier and especially with yeah. your Mars <laughs> and then Venus is in a cadent house so she just has less energy and we haven't gotten to assessing house placement or really talking about houses at all in this podcast mm. but we should do planets that too. who are <laughs> yeah planets in the third sixth ninth or twelfth house they'll just have less energy because they're in cadent houses um yeah so it's like you layer them and then all the nuance kind of like it all comes together and then you're you and you're different exactly. than someone else with a uh, venus and pisces would be yeah exactly yeah and that's i think that's a big thing that really drives me crazy with um modern astrology and a lot of the miscommunication not even modern astrology as a whole but like just a lot of the um the people who try to like really simplify astrology almost to a point where it doesn't make sense because it feels like so many articles you read or so many um so many things you see are just like oh Pisces Venus is a great placement right or like um leo suns are always a great placement like they make these very like blanket statements and then when you start to dive in you're like well you know a pisces venus in venus's bounds and a pisces venus in mars's bounds those are two different pisces venus (laughs) Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. these are two completely different energies and i hear people talk about degree theory a lot too which is more of a modern astrology take that i know absolutely zero about um but i definitely disagree with the theory but i feel like there's something that comes from the terms and the bounds that might bleed into that was one thing like talking about your venus being ruled by mars like Mm -hmm. one thing i did want to bring up with this is anoretic degrees and you'll notice that's the exception yeah and that definitely Demetra talks about that again I will hold this book up um <laughs> <laughs> like holding it on my lap for emotional support as we talk about this but, <laughs> I do um, the same thing don't worry <laughs> they have the book but she talks about Anna and I'll explain what those are but she talks about how that has actually survived into modern astrology by modern sure. astrology thinking that the last degrees of the zodiac signs are a difficult place but then maybe not necessarily realizing that it comes from this theory. And yes. so what anoretic yes. degrees are is they're the last few degrees of 
any zodiac sign, you'll notice all of them are ruled by either Mars or Saturn. Yes. And then in a lot of the signs, uh, like very late for the last degrees are also, my cat just like keeps coming in and out. So I'm sorry if you can hear him scratching. You can. Um, good. But yeah, there's just the late degrees of a lot of the signs are very malefic ruled. Like some places like, okay, you can get pretty late in cancer and it's still okay. But then you get to the very end and it's Saturn's bounds. Like, so the end of all of the Zodiac signs are anoretic, they're malefic ruled. And there's just this theory, this understanding that planets as they move through the end of any Zodiac sign are just struggling more. It's almost like they've been walking through this habitat, you know, because yeah. I really think of zodiac signs as habitats or like what's the land or the terrain that you're on. And they're at the end and they're just tired, they're tired. and they're ready for a fresh new energy. But then they're also moving through. It's like if you're on a hike and you come to Saturn's part of the hike, you're like having to cross an icy glacier and you're like, ah, this is very yeah. dangerous. Or, you know, Mars, there's like rocks falling on you. Like they need <laughs> to like go through difficult right. um, terrain <laughs> to then get to the beginning. Um, yeah. And yeah. The two anoretic degrees are zero and 29. So the first degree and the last degree. And so that first degree is very much this energy of like, it's that Aries energy, like a newborn baby. Like it's just, it's here. It's ready. It's like, okay, cool. Like I'm in a new sign. Let's figure out the energy. Let's get going. Let's do something. You know, it's like, it's a very excited energy and 29 degrees is a very tired but there's I have noticed there's a lot of wisdom that comes with 29 degree placements um because I always look for anoretic degrees and we probably could do a whole episode on just that but yeah. um I always look for those in people's charts always because that zero degree is very much like a new beginning but that final degree is very tired and it's it has both sides of it it's very exhausted and just like exactly what you just said where it's like I've been here for so long and now I'm finally at the end like I can finally take a break right but then there is kind of that other side of it where it has the knowledge like it's walked through everything so it knows what it's talking about like it's already seen everything there is to see about this space this community this terrain wherever it's traveling right like it's seen it all so it didn't just arrive and it's not excited and it's not like oh look at this new place like it's finally moving on so you know but it it's gonna give you the best instructions like it's gonna give you the best like tips and tricks or like if you're looking for a good restaurant like that's the one to ask right like because they've tried them all so that's how I like to think about that mm. like anoretic degree where, even though where it's are you difficult. getting the theory that it the anoretic degree includes the beginning of the sign like where does that come from because I've heard um, that before you haven't heard that no and even looking at Demetra's book she says um, another point to note is that one of the two malefic planets, either Mars or Saturn, is the bound lord of the last few degrees of each sign, and then talking about anoretic degrees in that context of the last mm -hmm. few degrees. So I'm just curious. And even from like the yeah. bound theory, for the most part, if once you get to zero, you're almost always ruled by malefic, I mean benefics, or mm -hmm. like Mars and Scorpio. Saturn and, yeah, and Libra home. who have dignity so I think it's really just cancer that actually has from the bound perspective mm -hmm. difficulty at the beginning so I'm just curious where the that anoretic theory that you're talking yeah about from. I'll have to find it because I've definitely done some research on it but Mercury retrograde I don't yeah <laughs> Mercury is so retrograde we, it's, it's so, like, retrograde. so retrograde right now I know I was gonna say I like don't want to misquote anything so I can yeah. pick that up but yeah it's basically just zero and like first and last interesting mm -hmm. um cool well regardless yeah. we're mainly just like bounds <laughs> for sure what we're talking about here with just whoever the bound lord of your planet is is then going to give a lot of context of um yeah 
the terrain that planet is yeah. dealing with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anything else to say about Bounds, Lori? I don't think so. Yeah, I think we were pretty thorough. Um, cool. Well, what do you, I guess this episode will be released around we'll probably be in greece when this episode is released we're going mm -hmm. to greece in september with jason holly and a bunch of other astrologers to visit all these mythic sacred sites of different deities which will be very exciting as you know you guys listening to the pod know Lori and i have been doing a lot of work with myth and particularly mm -hmm. greek myth and so going to the locations where the stories were actually developed and told is going to be um really nourishing so i'm excited to yeah. see what will come through for i'm sure future episodes will be really influenced by that experience um yeah what else yeah. do you have going on besides this big trip <laughs> yeah not a whole lot um i am still writing so yeah just once again plugging along if anybody has any asteroid stories please feel free to reach out and share them or if you want a reading or if you have any questions um I always want to talk asteroids I always want your stories so yeah, yeah. You reach out all her contact info is down in the comment or in the description of this episode and mm -hmm. um yeah I mean your work is so based on case studies so as many stories as possible please yes. share them with Lori <laughs> all of them <laughs> <laughs> and yeah I just am kind of doing the same I there's the links to my information down below as well and both Lori and I offer astrology readings you can book a reading with us I'm also an herbalist I blend personalized herbal teas and I've been doing a lot of writing on the medicinal virtues of lots of different herbs uh, so you can check out my writing page on my website as well if you want to learn about calendula or dandelion or rosemary I've done I believe two dozen herbs at this point so lots of fun research on there to learn about how to work with herbs um, yeah and just thank you to everyone for continuing to listen and support us and let us know if you work with the bounds if you find them useful if this is new for you we love hearing from folks as well yeah. Okay. Bye, everyone.